Legs burning and hands calloused, he gazes towards the remaining upward journey, each step producing a jolt of pain as he clears another obstacle. It can't possibly be much further, he wonders, as the end escapes his blurred vision. His racing heart and labored breath fill the quiet around him. His hands cradle the abrasive stone, forcing it higher as it tears at his skin. It feels impossibly heavy. Yet he continues, forcing progress where none should be found. The stone rolls, one crest after another. Finally, he reaches a plateau and collapses. His muscles fail him, as if they can sense the moment of rest. The end is in sight. Gathering his remaining strength, he picks himself up and drives forward into the final ascent, legs quivering. As his calves scream out, he presses his chest into the boulder, relentlessly moving it forward. Yet before he can reach the top, the boulder slips from his grasp. He attempts to stop its momentum, but it's too late. Inches turn to feet as he soon watches the boulder tumble down the mountain. Looking down, the boulder seems but a pebble at this distance. He hesitates for just one moment, taking in the reality of his existence, before beginning back down the mountain, doomed to his eternal fate. You may be familiar with the story of Sisyphus, the Greek myth of a king who cheated death and was punished by the gods. His punishment? Banishment to the underworld, made to roll a boulder up a mountain for the rest of eternity. Perhaps the worst part? He could never reach the top before the boulder would roll back to its original starting point, and he would be forced to begin again. This was his fate for all of eternity. Getting into the mind of Sisyphus, life signed away to this pointless and torturous task, is difficult enough on its own. Yet French philosopher Albert Camus took this further, into a deep and dark place that our minds fight with every urge to avoid. In the myth of Sisyphus, Camus argues that human existence is no different than the pointless life of Sisyphus in the underworld. We spend our days rolling our boulder up the mountain, and yet at the end of our lives it goes rolling back down again. Nothing of consequence in the universe having changed from our existence. To explain this, Camus explores three main points. One, human beings crave meaning in our lives. Two, the universe is irrational and ultimately meaningless, making our lives as humans just as meaningless. And three, we are doomed to an inescapable mortality. Putting this together, Camus paints a picture where human life is destined to return to the ashes from which we came, our existence having meant utterly nothing. Knowing this, Camus asks the question we so desperately try to ignore. Do we continue as Sisyphus does, rolling our boulder up the mountain, or do we hasten our inevitable descent into oblivion? Quote, there is but only one true serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy, end quote, Albert Camus. But why is Camus even raising this question? For many people, daily life has obvious meanings. We have jobs where we play integral roles, friends and families that depend on us, and many moments of joy in work, hobbies, and leisure. Never do thoughts such that Camus describes enter our minds on a regular basis. To many, this seems like a ridiculous question to even consider. Yet Camus explains how these thoughts begin to show themselves. Quote, we live on the future, tomorrow, later on, yet a day comes when a man notices or says that he is 30. Thus he asserts his youth, but simultaneously he situates himself in relation to time. He admits that he stands at a certain point on a curve that he acknowledges having to travel to its end. He belongs to time, and by the horror that seizes him, he recognizes his worst enemy. Tomorrow, he was longing for tomorrow, whereas everything in him ought to reject it. The true understanding of our own inevitable mortality provides a shock to the system. It rips us from the monotony of the familiar into the uncomfortable contemplation of what awaits us. Here begins the realization of the absurdity of life, an acknowledgement that something is awry. Quote, a man who has become conscious of the absurd is forever bound to it. End quote, Albert Camus. The absurdity of life is described on three grounds, as mentioned above. One, the human search for meaning. Two, the rationality of the universe, and three, the inevitability of death. Perhaps the one truth that permeates human experience more than any other is the desire for meaning in our lives. It is inescapable. Humanity likely would not have ascended to the heights we have if not for the narrative sense of meaning we feel throughout life. It's what motivates us to get out of bed in the morning, work a strenuous job, and create a good life for our families. Not only do we feel it regularly in our personal lives, but we also crave it in the stories that we tell. Why do we find films dramatic and engaging? Nearly always they are displaying grand struggles that point towards deep meaning in the characters' lives. Perhaps even more explicitly in our lives, we see the intense desire for meaning through ritual and religious practices all over the world. Because of all of this, Camus argues that our desire for meaning 
is one of the innate characteristics that make us human and one that we can't avoid or deny. The Irrationality of the Universe Throughout human existence, scientific discovery has advanced life in step functions towards greater understanding and utilization of the physical universe. We have created civilizations that can extend life, communicate across the world, and explore the universe. Yet Camus would argue that all of this is no true understanding of the universe. Quote, I realize that if through science I can seize phenomena and enumerate them, I cannot for all that apprehend the world. Were I to trace its entire relief with my finger, I should not know any more. And you give me that choice between a description that is sure, but that teaches me nothing, and hypotheses that claim to teach me, but that are not sure. End quote. We may be able to physically describe every aspect of the universe one day, but so what? This leads to an understanding of how the universe exists, but never why it exists. As a result, we are forced to contemplate if there is any meaning at all to the universe. In the realm of meaning, the universe replies to our desperation for answers with harrowing silence. Quote, the world itself, whose single meaning I do not understand, is but a vast irrational. If one could only say just once, this is all clear, all would be saved. End quote. Albert Camus. The Inevitability of Death. Death forces our hands. No matter our noble lives or considerable accomplishments, there is no escape, no way out. Throughout so much of our lives, we are used to control. Yet in this most important aspect, we are but at the whims of time. Camus was not religious and did not believe in an afterlife. For him, this life is it. There is nothing else. As we march forward with our lives, death inevitably waits for us. We cannot choose another path. Quote, the horror comes in reality from the mathematical aspect of the event. If time frightens us, this is because it works out the problem and the solution comes afterwards. All the pretty speeches about the soul will have their contrary convincingly proved, at least for a time. From this inert body on which a slap makes no mark, the soul has disappeared. This elementary and definitive aspect of the adventure constitutes the absurd feeling. Under the fatal lighting of that destiny, its uselessness becomes evident." End quote. Albert Camus. Combining these together, a picture begins to come into focus of why Camus believes that human existence is absurd. He explains, quote, The absurd is born of the confrontation between the human need and the unreasonable silence of the world. End quote. We can escape the insatiable need for meaning, an explanation of why we exist and what our lives are for in the universe. Yet the universe provides no such meaning. To make matters worse, the grains of sand of our lives are continuously flowing, with a guaranteed and definitive end. Even beyond our perspective on Earth, the best analyses suggest that the entire universe itself will ultimately end in complete heat death. No stars, no planets, just single particles too far away from each other to ever interact again floating aimlessly through a forever dark and lifeless universe. What do we do with the absurd nature of life? As Camus describes, quote, at any street corner, the feeling of absurdity can strike any man in the face, end quote. When confronted, it is not a feeling that can be ignored. As much as we may try and push it away into the depths of our subconscious, it comes crawling out, persistent for answers. Camus argues that it is natural for a body to fight against the absurd reality of life, Quote, in a man's attachment to life, there is something stronger than all the ills in the world. The body's judgment is as good as the mind's, and the body shrinks from annihilation. We get into the habit of living before acquiring the habit of thinking, end quote. We look for alternate explanations for why this life isn't truly the end, or why our lives have a greater meaning in the universe. Camus argues that we must reject this. Quote, the typical act of eluding the fatal evasion that constitute the third theme of this essay is hope. Hope of another life one must deserve, or trickery of those who live not for life itself, but for some great idea that will transcend it, refine it, give it a meaning, and betray it. End quote. He explains further why, for him, certainty of the afterlife is an evasion to addressing absurdity. Quote, there is no logical certainty here. There is no experimental probability either. All I can say is that, in fact, that transcends my scale. I want to know whether I can live with what I know and with that alone." End quote. Soren Kierkegaard provides a plea for why humanity must have eternal consciousness. Quote, if man had no eternal consciousness, if at the bottom of everything there were merely a wild, seething force producing everything, both large and trifling, in the storm of dark passions, if the bottomless void that nothing can fill underlay all things, what would life be but despair? End quote. This is the question that Camus demands answered, not with uncertain evasions and not with denials. Camus invites us not to run from the reality that faces us, 
but rather address its absurdity head on. Quote, the absurd man, he recognizes the struggle, does not absolutely scorn reason and admits the irrational, end quote. He continues, quote, seeking what is true is not seeking what is desirable. If in order to elude the anxious question, what would life be, one must feed on the roses of illusion, then the absurd mind, rather than resigning itself to falsehood, prefers to adopt fearlessly Kierkegaard's reply, despair, end quote. To this point, the myth of Sisyphus has provided a sobering outlook on our mortal lives. Camus in the first sentence questions whether life is worth living at all. The next 20 pages then provide a tour de force into the depths of nihilism. After descending these depths, Camus does something particularly surprising. Despite everything he's been saying about the absurdity of life, Camus begins to craft an argument for why, even acknowledging all of this, life is worth living. Camus first acknowledges that a solution to the absurdity of life cannot include an elimination of one of its conditions. We have discussed a few of these conditions already. One we have not discussed, however, is human consciousness itself. The absurdity of the universe only exists because human consciousness exists to contemplate it. Elimination of human consciousness is thus tantamount to eliminating and evading the problem rather than truly solving it, as Camus explains. Quote, to destroy one of the terms is to destroy the whole. There can be no absurd outside of the human mind. If I attempt to solve a problem, at least I must not, by that very solution, conjure away one of the terms of the problem, end quote. Suicide is not an answer to the absurd nature of the universe, and is the first idea we must dispense with when contemplating the meaning of our existence. We will continually revisit this point throughout the rest of Camus' analysis. If we are to accept the absurd facts as presented above, what would an absurd life look like? For Camus, there are three consequences of living with the absurd. Revolt, freedom, and passion. The absurd weighs on us heavy, an inescapable burden that can be felt at all times. Camus explains how living itself is the ultimate revolt against this heavy burden. Quote, To abolish conscious revolt with suicide is to avoid the problem. Living is keeping the absurd alive. Keeping it alive is above all contemplating it. The absurd dies only when we turn away from it. One of the only coherent philosophical positions is thus revolt. It is a constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. End quote. He continues to explain why this ends up being beneficial. Quote, Just as danger provided man the unique opportunity of seizing awareness, so metaphysical revolt extends awareness to the whole of experience. End quote. Our lives, when aware of the absurd and our obscurity, heightens our existence. It makes us hyper-aware of the experiences in life and their finite nature, producing a greater connection and a more intimate felt experience of life. Camus summarizes, quote, That revolt is a certainty of a crushing fate, without the resignation that ought to accompany it. That is where it is seen to what a degree absurd experience is remote from suicide. It may be thought that suicide follows revolt, but wrongly, for it does not represent the logical outcome of revolt. End quote. Our revolt acknowledges the fate that awaits us, but refuses to bow, refuses to accept our future any earlier than required. Quote, it escapes suicide to the extent it is simultaneously awareness and rejection of death, end quote, explains Camus. We choose the vibrant and unique experiences of life, choosing to live with the absurd. We may be ultimately condemned to death, but in the meantime, we choose life. Quote, that revolt gives life its value. Spread out over this whole length of a life, it restores its majesty to that life. End quote. Albert Camus. Quote, the absurd man can only drain everything to the bitter end and deplete himself, for he knows that in that consciousness and in that day-to-day -day revolt he gives proof of his only truth, which is defiance. End quote. Albert Camus. Knowing that humanity craves a sense of meaning in our lives, what Camus explains next might be the most surprising. He argues Quote, at this point, the problem is reversed. It was previously a question of finding out whether or not life had to have a meaning to be lived. It now becomes clear on the contrary that it will be lived all the better if it has no meaning, end quote. To unpack this, imagine that humanity had a defined purpose from which our lives derived meaning. Let's imagine for the sake of argument that the ultimate purpose of human life was to manufacture paper clips. No matter what we do in life, it must be towards our ultimate goal of producing paper clips. All of our educational lives are spent studying every detail about the paperclip. All of our working years are spent producing as many paperclips as possible. Even our romantic relationships have the ultimate goal of producing children who can produce more paperclips in the future. 
Everything has an understandable and defined meaning, and there's no question of the purpose of life. Yet one day, we realize the absurdity of the universe. That one day humanity, let alone us individually, will cease to exist. Every paperclip we have ever contributed to will disintegrate into dust. The meaning we thought our lives had cowers in the face of the ultimate meaninglessness of the universe. Suddenly, the defined meaning of our lives has become chains. We go through life producing paperclips, unable to escape our purpose, despite knowing the irrelevancy of it all. That is why, for Camus, life having no meaning, paradoxically, is necessary for a good life in an absurd world. When discussing freedom, Camus is not interested in a philosophical question of free will, but rather the felt experience of man's own freedom. As discussed above, Camus believes life to be best lived without a greater purpose mandated for us. With a defined purpose, we feel obligated to pursue certain dictates that align with said purpose. Camus explains, quote, To the extent to which he imagined a purpose to his life, he adapted himself to the demands of a purpose to be achieved and became the slave of his liberty, end quote. He continues, quote, The return to consciousness, the escape from everyday sleep, represents the first steps of absurd freedom, end quote. In this realization, the common expectations of life fade away. We are free to act, not according to a predefined role, but rather to decide in each moment for ourselves how to proceed. We are thus the authors of our own existence and can choose how to spend our precious minutes of life in a way we deem fit, not confined to boundaries we typically place on ourselves. Camus elaborates, quote, Assured of his temporally limited freedom, of his revolt devoid of future, and of his mortal consciousness, he lives out his adventure within the span of his lifetime, end quote. Quote, all that remains is a fate whose outcome alone is fatal. Outside of that single fatality of death, everything, joy or happiness, is liberty. A world remains of which man is the sole master. What bound him was the illusion of another world. End quote. Albert Camus. Camus expresses that the quantity of experiences is what truly matters. A confusing term, Camus explains, quote, to two men living the same number of years, the world will always provide the same sum of experiences. It is up to us to be conscious of them. Being aware of one's life, one's revolt, one's freedom, and to the maximum is living, and to the maximum, end quote. Here Camus expresses how a passion for life leads to more conscious awareness of life, and thus more years of life. This passion leads us to be in the present moment, experiencing the totality of life rather than missing years of life in a mental fog. He explains, quote, Having started from an anguished awareness of the inhuman, the meditation on the absurd returns at the end of its itinerary to the very heart of the passionate flames of human revolt. End quote. In summation of the consequences of the absurd, Camus writes, quote, Thus I draw from the absurd three consequences, which are my revolt, my freedom, and my passion. By the mere activity of consciousness, I transform into a rule of life what was an invitation to death, and I refuse suicide. I know, to be sure, the dull resonance that vibrates throughout these days, yet I have but a word to say, that it is necessary." End quote. We return once again to Sisyphus. Rolling his boulder up a mountain in the underworld, Camus views him as the absurd hero. Quote, his scorn of the gods, his hatred of death, and his passion for life won him that unspeakable penalty in which the whole being is exerted toward accomplishing nothing. This is the price that must be paid for the passions of this earth. End quote. If you recall, Sisyphus never reaches the top with his boulder and watches it tumble down the mountain, only to begin down the mountain again to start over. It is this return that intrigues Camus. Quote, it is during that return, that pause, that Sisyphus interests me. I see that man going back down with a heavy yet measured step toward the torment of which he will never know the end. That hour, like a breathing space, which returns as surely as his suffering, that is the hour of consciousness. At each of those moments when he leaves the heights and gradually sinks toward the layers of the gods, he is superior to his fate. He is stronger than his rock. This is the revolt of the absurd man, refusing to bow, accepting his fate, and continuing nonetheless. Camus continues, Quote, if this myth is tragic, that is because its hero is conscious. Where would his torture be indeed if at every step the hope of succeeding upheld him? The workman of today works every day in his life at the same tasks, and this fate is no less absurd. But it is tragic only at the rare moments when it becomes conscious. Sisyphus, proletarian of the gods, 
powerless and rebellious, knows the whole extent of his wretched condition. It is what he thinks of during his descent. The lucidity that was to constitute his torture, at the same time, crowns his victory. End quote. All is not lost, as he continues. Quote, if the descent is thus sometimes performed in sorrow, it can also take place in joy. This word is not too much. Again, I fancy Sisyphus returning toward his rock, and the sorrow was in the beginning, when the images of earth clung too tightly to memory. When the call of happiness becomes too insistent, it happens that melancholy rises in man's heart. This is the rock's victory. This is the rock itself. But crushing truths perish from being acknowledged. Thus Oedipus, a tragic Greek figure, at the outset obeys fate without knowing it, but from the moment he knows his tragedy begins. Then a tremendous remark rings out. Despite so many ordeals, my advanced age and the nobility of my soul make me conclude that all is well. End quote. Despite the weight of inescapable mortality and an ultimately meaningless existence, we can choose to conclude that all is well. Camus continues, quote, Happiness and the absurd are two sons of the same earth. They are inseparable. I conclude that all is well, says Oedipus, and that remark is sacred. It echoes in the wild and limited universe of man. It teaches that all is not, has not been, exhausted. It makes of fate a human matter, which must be settled among men. End quote. All Sisyphus's silent joy is contained therein. His fate belongs to him. His rock is his thing. Likewise, the absurd man, when he contemplates his torment, silences all the idols. There is no sun without shadow, and it is essential to know the night. The absurd man says yes, and his effort will henceforth be unceasing. If there is a personal fate, there is no higher destiny, or at least there is but one which he concludes is inevitable and despicable. For the rest, he knows himself to be the master of his days. At that subtle moment, when man glances backward over his life, Sisyphus returning toward his rock. In that sight, pivoting, he contemplates that series of unrelated actions which becomes his fate, created by him, combined under his memory's eye, and soon sealed by his death. Thus convinced of the wholly human origin of all that is human, a blind man eager to see, who knows that the night has no end, he is still on the go. The rock is still rolling. I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain, one always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. This universe henceforth without a master seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain, in itself forms a world. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. End quote. The feeling of the absurd arrived at me spontaneously more than a year prior to reading the myth of Sisyphus. This work and these ideas provoke a visceral reaction, perhaps unlike any other. This is not just an intellectual matter, this is our existence which is under scrutiny. Throughout the book we are plunged into the depths of nihilism, as if we are sinking to the bottom of the ocean, being swallowed by darkness, light above fading out of sight. Yet from that darkness we swim upward, one kick at a time. Eventually we reach within grasp of the light and pull ourselves out of the spiral of nihilism. Arising from the darkness, everything appears brighter, colors more vibrant. This life is precious, a gift given without explanation. The darkness and depths of the ocean are still there, but now merely exist as a contrast to the rays of sunshine on the beach. Instead of accepting the darkness early, we will enjoy our time in the sun, embracing the gift of consciousness, before the sands of our time run out as they do for every man. Quote, the proceeding merely defines a way of thinking, but the point is to live. Albert Camus.